In 1989, the Chinese Communist Party massacred students in Beijing. This year, they covered up the coronavirus. What will it take to get them to change? Welcome back to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. 31 years ago, the Tiananmen Square Massacre made very clear what kind of government China had. The Chinese Communist Party massacred thousands of students whose only crime was asking for freedom. For those who survived, the nightmare was only beginning. They had to pretend like nothing ever happened or face a lifetime of persecution and exile. So today, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, has managed to erase the Tiananmen Square massacre from the history books, at least inside mainland China. Why should the rest of the world care what happens in China? We all have our own problems. Well, the CCP's cover-ups and lies do affect us. One way is the coronavirus. Instead of dealing with the outbreak early, the CCP tried to cover it up, and that helped it spread around the world. So, what will it take to get the CCP to change? Recently, the Chilean think tank, Foundation for Progress, invited me to join their project called Dissidents. They've been gathering testimony from people who have the courage to speak out against repressive regimes. And on their June 4th program, I interviewed Tiananmen survivor Yang Jianli. He now lives in exile as a human rights activist. He created the Foundation for China in the 21st century to talk about what China can become after the Chinese Communist Party falls. Here's the interview. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Chris. So, do you see any parallels between how the Chinese Communist Party covered up the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989 and how they covered up the coronavirus outbreak in 2020? Yes, I uh, have been telling the world, the regime that is uh, ruling China, the CCP regime, is the same regime that massacred thousands of students uh, 31 years ago in Tiananmen Square. The nature of this regime has not changed, although China has undergone tremendous change, especially economically. And today, uh, the public health crisis the coronavirus outbreak, once again uh, exposed the nature of this regime. So we understand that once again, this regime put power and control over human lives. They um, consider the solidarity, the stability of its power more important than anything else. So do you think the communist party is responsible for the coronavirus outbreak? Yes, of course. And um, according to the information and evidence we have collected, actually it's everywhere. If you want to make a little effort into it, you will see Chinese government, the CCP, is almost fully responsible for the initially controllable virus outbreak to become a global pandemic. And uh, when the virus outbreak first uh, happened in China, and the first reaction of the regime is cover up because they think this uh, crisis can make the whole society unstable. And the regime always want to look good. So they cover up and suppress the um, uh, free speech and crack down on whistleblowers. And uh, at least some experts estimate at least the um, uh, delayed um, three weeks or even longer uh, to react to the virus outbreak. Uh, that actually helped the virus to spread to the entire world. There, there are people who say that uh, how the Chinese Communist Party responded to the coronavirus outbreak. It was authoritarian, but it was effective. It stopped the spread of the virus. What do you have to say about that? Um, yep, uh, it, there are a lot of sayings about that, but we cannot forget the fact. It is the CCP that who 
covered up the truth, cover up the situation, and um, uh, play down the extent of the casualty in China so that other countries did not pay close attention to what's going on. And that actually helped the uh, outbreak become a, a global catastrophe. And um, even in China, now we see the virus outbreak has been put under control seemingly, seemingly. but still people skeptical about the information provided by the Chinese government. We have no much information whatsoever whether there are still more cases coming up every day and how many actually died. We still have no uh, exact number about it. And uh, because the authoritarian power can put the measures into uh, the whole society with very restricted um, uh, um, um, restricted uh, tools and uh, measures. Uh, of course, you know, uh, to a certain degree, it will control the spread of the virus. But at the same time, the sufferings of people because of, uh, the government's heavy-handed restriction on the movement and, and everything else, especially uh, uh, free speech, how much people have suffered. And the outer world has no idea about it. And uh, we all know the, the whistleblower, uh, Li Wenliang's story. His death actually unleashed the people's anger against the government and caused the people to demand for free speech uh, with a very strong voice. It's unprecedentedly strong. And the government, instead of uh, learning lessons um, and changing behavior, uh, it doubled down ever since the death of Li Yi Wenliang on clamping down on their free expression and free speech. And many dissidents and uh, citizen journalists ever since have ever since uh, wound up and disappeared. So this fact should not be overlooked. Well, so whether we're talking about the Tiananmen Square massacre or the coronavirus, it seems the Chinese Communist Party has a fondness for cover-ups. What is it about the communist system there that encourages these kind of cover-ups? Yep. Uh, as I said earlier, they put power and control over human lives. When anything happens, anything serious happens, their authorities know better than anybody else. Probably this incident or disaster caused by the government's action, either by negligence or by cor corrupt behavior. So the first reaction is always to cover up, not let people to know what's going on. Any truth can trigger people's uh, 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 demand for more open up, for transparency, and can um, can set off uh, the social unrest. Uh, so this is their mindset. It's always cover up because you know uh, to um, to continue its rule, to uh, support its rule. Um, they not only use violence but always use lie, always use lies. If people know the truth, the regime cannot sustain. So they understand that better than anybody else. I think it's really interesting to compare China and Taiwan's response to the coronavirus. Taiwan, it's another, it's another country of Chinese people, but it's a democracy. It handled the coronavirus in a very open, transparent way. And it seems based on the number of deaths and uh, cases of the coronavirus, Taiwan has handled better than any other country. So what, what, what is the difference between these two countries of Chinese people? Yes, um, it is inevitable from day one. Uh, there are going to be a contest between democracy and autocracy in handling this uh, crisis and uh, comparing two systems. And China, of course, is uh, the first 
who were affected by this um, uh, uh, virus outbreak. And Taiwan is very close to China. People would think oh, Taiwan would be affected, will be hit hard. But it turns out to be just the opposite. People keep asking, asking why. First of all, Taiwan is uh, the, probably the country who knows China best, better than any other country, who does not trust what the CCP says, anything. Because they has had, you know, tremendous experience uh, dealing with this uh, uh, regime. So they don't trust the information provided by the Chinese government. And just a uh, um, couple of months earlier, when Tsai Ing-wen was re-elected, China cut off the tourists. So that actually cut the people from China travel to Taiwan. But at the same time, when, uh, when Wuhan was locked down, but many residents of Wuhan just traveled to the rest of the world, not to Taiwan. And additionally, Taiwan is very responsive, and um, government is really responsive to the people, very transparent, and uh, these all uh, contribute to their uh, achievement in containing this uh, uh, virus outbreak. Very ironically, Taiwan is not the member of WHO, the World Health Organization, which is supposed to coordinate the international effort to defend the people's life against the, uh, the disaster uh, like this. But it turns out to be the, the country that is not the member of WHO fares the best. It says a lot. This says a lot. So well, I always part of the World Health Organization. Yeah, yeah, says a lot about uh, about uh, WHO. I uh, when people ask me a question about Taiwan and uh, WHO, I always say, imagine a mountain village frequently attacked by wild animals. Hired uh, uh, a defender to engage in collective defense of the village. And one despot in the village is bullying uh, a villager who does not like and exclude him from the collective defense system. And the defenders, the hired defender, uh, 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 sub submit to their evil power of despot. You know, just uh, totally exclude this villager out of the system. But one day a wolf attacked. It turns out, turns out to be that the villager, excluded a villager, fares the best, um, suffered the least the carrot. But all others suffered much, much more carrot. What does that say about the defender and the despot? So I always want to tell people what's going on with this example. Well, so China has been very effective at getting the World Health Organization to exclude Taiwan. Uh, it also seems that the World Health Organization has actually been praising China's response to the coronavirus since day one. Um, why is that? Um, yeah, that's a very, very good question. And um, we look into the background of Tedros, the Director General of WHO, we found he was on the top leadership for many years of uh, authoritarian regime, one of the worst um, human rights violators in the world. And during uh, his um, term as Minister of Health uh, of Ethiopia, he actually covered up for one uh, virus. I don't remember the virus name. So the people of Ethiopia has made it public when he was uh, running for the director general of WHO. And uh, I think he had a track record to show that he's that what kind of person he is. And uh, he 
he, his record shows he likes the dictators and is supported by dictators. He is supported for his um, candidacy by the Central American dictators and by dictator from China and other world dictators. He got elected with a, a larger vote. And, uh, and uh, uh, just a few months after he assumed the post as the director general, he appointed Robert Mugabe, you know, the notorious dictator, as a goodwill ambassador of WHO. And only with the pressure did he rescind that appointment. So this is, I have a lot of examples. This example shows tendrils. The director general of uh, WHO likes dictators, favors dictators, and also is a favorite of dictators. Uh, in handling this uh, current virus outbreak, he obviously helped China to cover up. When China cover up and crack down on the whistleblowers, he said openly multiple times that China uh, committed to tra transparency. Nothing is further from uh, truth. And, um, you know, he delayed, um, you know, according to China's will to declare uh, this is a global pandemic and things like that. We have a lot of examples. Just uh, not uh, two weeks ago, um, my friend Aaron Wold and myself wrote an article, the key questions for WHO. So I come up, we come up with uh, 17 questions directly related to this, uh, to uh, WHO's handling of this uh, virus outbreak. And I think if, if WHO is to remain credible, it must answer these questions publicly and in detail. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has also been spreading a message that uh, the coronavirus didn't actually begin in China. It actually was started by the U.S. military. Uh, are these kind of propaganda tactics common? It's uh, very common. And uh, after the first stage, um, China seemed to gradually put the virus under control. And at the same time, the virus spread to the rest of the world, plunged various countries into total catastrophe with uh, serious economic consequences. And China found opportunity to engage in disinformation campaign so that to rebuild its public image and also take the opportunity to play as a leader in global governance, if you will. So the first thing they did at the end of February uh, was to send out you know, the information, the rumors about the origin of this virus. The origin of the virus was once no question is, you know, is, is nobody actually questioned the origin of the virus in the first two months. That was in Wuhan, right? That is Wuhan. Nobody, until the end of February, when the top uh, expert uh, of China in containing the virus said publicly, oh, the ori or origin of the virus may not be in China, not mainly from China. Then after that, the, the, uh, we call it a wolf style diplomats uh, of China, uh, you know, use the social media that is forbidden in China to spread out this rumor uh, about the origin of the virus. First, they, they blame the U.S. military um, of, of, uh, to bring the virus to China. Uh, then Italy, just a couple of days ago, the People's Daily, the, the party's uh, mouthpiece, featured an article saying that an expert in France just reported, you know, the, the, uh, uh, 
the virus actually developed, developed from some other virus from France. So all of a sudden, the origin of the virus now is in France. So probably next time it would be uh, UK. And so they try to um, muddy the water, if, if, if you will, so that they can uh, uh, um, disturb the international effort to come together to hold China accountable. Mm -hmm. So this kind of disinformation campaign does not work in the international community, but we must notice that it works to a certain degree in China. A lot of Chinese people actually believe uh, what the Chinese government has told them about the origin of the virus. So this is very sad. Do you think it will be a situation like the Tiananmen Square massacre, where people inside China in a few years have no idea the truth about the coronavirus, that the Communist Party successfully covers it up? Uh, despite the government's best effort, this time I don't think it will be so successful as it did in the aftermath of the Tiananmen massacre. Uh, the reason being uh, with the internet, uh, although China has a severe, um, uh, severe uh, censorship on uh, the information on internet, people still find a variety of ways to get around the firewall to get information from the outside world. And uh, uh, this time, even the people in, within the party, in the party, even on the lead, uh, top leadership, have um, been, um, um, how to say, have different views um, than what Xi Jinping has. And also, uh, some kind of uh, undercurrent has been going on, trying to form an uh, opposition against uh, the China's leader, uh, dictator, Xi, uh, Xi Jinping. And of course, Xi Jinping has been um, trying to control uh, with um, heavy-handed measure. Uh, on the one hand, uh, continue to purge the potential enemies. Just in a few uh, past weeks, a uh, couple of uh, top uh, sen uh, senior officials has been purged. And on the other hand, uh, continue and intensify the inter international action. It's more aggressively in South, South China Sea and other area, trying to prepare or create a military clash or some kind of clash with outside world to deflect the uh, criticism, criticism and the pressure uh, from uh, internal politics. So Xi Jinping is trying to do something, but other people at the same time try to form opposition against him with the information, everything. What I would say, despite the best effort of Xi Jinping, this time I don't think the regime will be so successful. Hmm. Your conference uh, was allegedly hacked at a COVID con in April. Uh, tell us what happened. Um, I... Uh, gave a keynote speech at the uh, COVID con uh, that was held uh, April 13th. Yeah, and after my presentation, uh, there was QA session, and I answered the three questions. When I tried to answer the fourth question, my the, the screen, my computer just uh, went black. And uh, I tried to reboot it and turn, try to turn on uh, multiple times, but I failed to do it. And, um, and uh, then I just uh, tried, I called my uh, technical uh, team to help me, and I tried to reboot it to rejoin the conference. But we tried uh, for a couple of hours. We didn't um, uh, uh, get uh, turned on. And uh, later, the organizer of the conference called me, asked me what's going on. And everybody thought that was attack, attacker from uh, CCP. And uh, because this conference 
had been um, um, uh, sending out a notice uh, to let people to join. So by that time, the authorities in China must have uh, been aware of the conference. Uh, they know the purpose of the conference. They knew that I would speak. So very likely that, is, that was a tech from uh, uh, China. Is this something you have to face a lot? Yes, of course. And uh, we constantly face these kind of attacks, especially when the so-called sensitive dates, when we put together an um, uh, event commemorating Tiananmen Square Massacre, for example, we would uh, receive uh, one, uh, uh, attacks one kind or another. Do you think, with the coronavirus, do you think this will change how the world views China? Yes, I think the international relations, China's international relations, will, under, will undergo tremendous change. And uh, I, as we said earlier, this uh, public health crisis exposed the nature once again of the CCP regime, even to a larger uh, degree. And now one consensus has gradually um, built up uh, in the international community. That is, we must come together to hold the CCP to account uh, for its mistake if not intention, intentionally to, to harm the, the rest of the world uh, for covering up the outbreak so that uh, the entire world has been uh, plunged in such a crisis uh, with um, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives uh, lost. And that's the consensus I think will be built up. Another consensus is also uh, in the process of building up, but we don't know which direction it will take. That is, many countries now realize that too much relying on China's supply chain will have serious problem when such a thing happens. So I think in the future, international trade, in the future globalization, this will be a very, very important question. Everybody will consider and um, will not uh, ignore. And um, as a result, so the relationship of the rest of the world with China would be no longer the same as it used to be uh, before the onset of the virus. Well, certainly a big problem in the coronavirus outbreak has been that uh, China manufactures most of the world's medical supplies. Um, other than moving these kind of critical supply chains out of China, what are some ways the international community would be able to hold China accountable? Um, this is a very difficult, difficult question. Some individuals have already filed a lawsuit in court um, asking China to pay. Um, but there are a lot of obstacles in the, um, in the, um, in the law, either here or any in international law anywhere. And it's not an easy job. I think it's up to the world leaders, the leaders of the world democracies and their parliaments to find a way to bring all the democracy together to confront China on this question. How we will hold China accountable? And more important questions, when doing this, how the invasion that is the opportunity for them to help China to change. And this pressure should be applied on Xi Jinping and its regime, not on the people of China. If China pay, I think ultimately that, that is the burden would be on the people of China. So this pressure, I think, should be applied on the regime in a way that can press the regime to change. 
to press the leadership to crack open so that the people and the officials inside the party who want to move forward to combine a viable opposition to move China forward. So we must have that uh, vision uh, in doing this. And um, uh, I still uh, cannot see um, that uh, movement in the international community. So we will continue to advocate for that. Some have called the coronavirus, the Chinese Communist Party's Chernobyl. Uh, do you think that's accurate? Um, yes, I think the chance to change China is definitely higher than, for example, it was at the end of last year. And because of this cri uh, crisis, everything is changing. And I think we stand a high chance, uh, but we still have to look at the four factors. The first factor, how long the people's anger against the regime can last, how general, how universal that is. I, uh, my personal belief is it will last, but we, we may not see it on the surface because of the suppression. Uh, and there has been general robust discontent with the government already. So this just added up. And the second factor is whether we can translate that people's sentiment, demanding for change, anger against the current regime into a viable democratic opposition. The third factor is whether the people, I mean the officials in the top leadership can crack open for many reasons. One, Xi Jinping has been building up his notorious person, personality cult. Uh, for his only political gain, he removed the term limit, trying to make himself a president for life. And the failure uh, in the foreign policy uh, with U.S. and other countries, trade war with China, with the uh, U.S., uh, the 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 failure in uh, Hong Kong, in Taiwan, so you name it. So for these policy failures, some people inside the party may want to crack open. So that's the third factor we have to look look at, and um, the fourth factor is international factor. We just talked about how the democracy can come together to confront China, to press the regime to open up, to crack open, to help China to change. And at the same, same time, when people try to build a new globalization, we have to put that into consideration. Should we have the old, I mean, the, the globalization that we had before the onset of outbreak? I don't think globalization in the future would be the same, but what would be different? What would be different? So to me, I think the major powers, the major economies must have a consistent value system. And uh, not only uh, market economy, but in politics. It won't work. The globalization as we had before, won't work if we have major powers, democracy, market economy, human rights. But uh, one major power is closer society, unfair treat, um, uh, violating human rights, and all these things happen. I, I don't think that can coexist for a long time in such globalization. We have to put this question into consideration uh, about what kind of a globalization we will have. When all these factors work together, of course, China must have a Chernobyl moment. Um, because of uh, uh, this virus outbreak, or not because of this uh, virus outbreak, and you know, crisis will happen anyway. I predicted a long time ago, when I look at these four factors, 
I said once at uh, a hearing in the European Subcommittee of Human Rights, the only thing needed probably just a crisis. The crisis will bring the four factors together. So it is happening. Well, thank you very much for joining me and talking about all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for watching. And as I said, I did this interview in collaboration with the project Dissidents, which you can find on dissidents.org. Check out their other work. They have content in Spanish and English. The link is below. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.